On the 15th of December of 1927, Marion Parker was dismissed from Mount Vernon Junior High School by somebody posing as an employee of her father. Now, ransom notes would ensue, and so would signs with disturbing letters. Today we're discussing the death of Marion Parker. Hey everybody, what's up? Welcome back. If you're new here, I'm Liz, and today we're going to be discussing the death of Frances Marion Parker, or Marion Parker as she is known. Now, if you're new here, obviously, like I just said, I'm Liz. I talk about true crime on this channel, anything to do with crime, unidentified, unsolved, solved homicides, all of the above. I like to cover it all. If you are also new here, don't forget to turn your bell notification on at all and hit that red subscribe button. That way you know whenever I upload and you can enjoy more of my content. So let's get into this one. It's kind of a doozy. I had no idea about this case and man, there's some details about this case that's just like... <sighs> You don't think that somebody at this time would think about this. Marion was born Frances Marion Parker in Los Angeles, California on the 11th of October of 1915. Now she was born to Geraldine and Perry Parker and she was also a twin to her sister Marjorie. Now Marion would be excused from her class, like I said, by somebody posing to be an employee of her father. Mr. Cooper as he went by. That was his that was his pseudonym. He would say that her father was in an accident and that Perry wanted Marion to come see him. He Perry had asked for Mr. Cooper to like bring her to him. Now Mary Holt, she was actually supposed to be like the secretary at the school, but the principal is out for that morning. So she took charge of the administrative duties. Now apparently Mary asked which one he was talking about and I guess Mr. Cooper was just like, uh, the younger one? He was super confused. Mary then just assumed that he meant Marion and then she retrieved her. So Mr. Cooper was completely unaware of the fact that Marion was a twin because he wasn't there to bring her to her father. He was there to abduct her. Now Mary Holt didn't know that, which I mean she would she never would have known that at that time because I mean you don't know people's true intent when it comes to abducting children. When the principal returned to the school, she told she I mean Mary told the principal about the accident that Perry Parker was in, but none of them would inform Marjorie about what happened. Now when Marjorie got out of school, she found it weird that Marion wasn't there waiting for her at their town car to bring them home. But she just decided that she didn't want to like go home late or miss the town car, so she went home. She even told her mother, Geraldine, that Marion wasn't there at the end of the school day. But her mother wasn't really alarmed. She just simply thought that Marion was staying behind to clean the classroom. Now the class was supposed to have Christmas parties that evening, so she wasn't really that concerned. Or so she thought. <laughs> So Geraldine just kind of thought that she would be home later. Now this is until Perry Parker called the school asking about Marion and Mary Holt answered the phone. Mary was really confused and went on to ask him about how he was feeling because of the accident he was in and that Marion went home with Mr. Cooper earlier that day. Well, to his surprise, Perry Parker was very like confused and he explained that he stayed home all day because it was his 40th birthday and that he was never in an accident. Hello, abduction. After he would get off the phone, there was a telegram that was delivered to the Parker residence. This would be the first letter from Western Union, apparently signed by Marion, coming from Pasadena. Now, this happened before they decided to call the police. And then another letter came in, and it was signed by George Fox. And this came from Alhambra. Now, Marjorie said that on the way to school that morning, there was a man in a streetcar that followed along with the Parker's town car. Now, the following day after the abduction, another letter and a ransom note came in, and the police came to the Parker residence. The next letter was signed with the name Fate. There was also a letter from Marion that said she was afraid she was gonna die. Apparently Mary Holt, the, you know, his administrative secretary was beside herself, absolutely beside herself, and she had to be sedated because she felt so bad about what had happened. The police then went to the school and asked her questions about Mr. Cooper's appearance, and I, she just went on about how bad she felt about what had happened to Marion, and she just couldn't believe this was happening. So on the 17th, Perry receives a phone call from the kidnap. This would be to establish a meetup with the, to deliver the ransom money, and that they would meet at West Fifth Street 
on in South Manhattan Place in LA. Now about 7.15, Perry received a phone call from the kidnapper and Perry immediately left to go to the location of which they discussed. At about 8 p.m., he was confronted by the kidnapper who was driving a Chrysler Coupe. He pulled up next to Perry and held him at gunpoint. And this was at a this was with a sawed-off shotgun. The assailant also had a bandana covering his face to conceal his identity. Now Perry also noticed that he was kind of familiar with this guy's voice. He knew it from somewhere. He just put, couldn't put his finger on it. Now what the odd part was is that he could see Marion after the abductor lifted a blanket off of her, and she was covered up to her neck with clothing, but she wasn't moving. Her eyes were open, he called out to her, but she didn't respond. He just kind of assumed that she was drugged. Now, as soon as Perry handed over the money, the kidnapper put the car in gear, drove forward a little bit, and pushed Marion out of the car. Now, in some reports, apparently, the kidnapper says, here's your daughter, before throwing her on the street. Perry gets out of the car, he rushes over to what seemed like a package, but that's not what he would find. He unwrapped this package, and he discovered Marion's corpse specifically her torso and her head. Now, this is when Marion obviously is discovered as being dead, and Perry calls the cops. Marion's body is recovered from the street, and an autopsy is performed at 9 p.m. on the 17th of December, and it's revealed that Marion had already been dead for about 12 hours. Her arms and legs had been amputated at the joint. She had also been disemboweled in her body severed below the navel, and then she was stuffed with a towel and a man's shirt. But that's not all. Remember how her eyes were, you know, wide open? Well, I hope you're not squeamish. If you, uh, if you watched my Israel Keys video, this is, uh, kind of similar. He stitched her eyes open with piano wires to make it look like she was alive. Very, very similar to Israel Keys, you know, many years prior. But where were her limbs? That's a big question. Where are her limbs? So the following morning at Elysian Park, a man was just simply on his morning walk and he found the amputated arms and legs of a child. This was Marion's limbs. They were wrapped in newspaper and they were just laying in a sporadic pattern on the street. Police then would I like positively identify them as being Marion's after they recovered them. Just about an hour after the limbs were found, her thighs and her torso, the rest of her torso, was discovered when two young boys were hiking in the woods. During her autopsy as well, it was believed that the medical examiner found evidence that Marion was alive during the time her limbs were being severed. Now this is when the manhunt for her killer began. It involved 20,000 police officers and the American Legion volunteers. There was a reward of 50,000 to whoever could identify and capture this killer, whether they catch him dead or alive. Now, this reward was later raised to 100000 after the public contributed to the search and seizure of this man. On December 20th, the Chrysler Coupe was found, and it was completely abandoned, and the police took fingerprints off of it. This car was indeed stolen and was found in San Diego. Well, these fingerprints were run, and they were matched to 19-year-old William Edward Hickman. William Hickman used to work with Perry Parker. Now, he was an officer, and Perry was an assistant cashier at the time. Now, about one year prior to this crime, Hickman was arrested after Perry Parker complained about Hickman stealing and forging checks that totaled about $400. Now, Hickman spent about six months in Kansas City, Missouri, before he returned to L.A. after he was sentenced to probation instead of jail time. Now, when he was in Missouri, this is when he stole the gray coupe from a doctor in this car he would drive back to California. When he went back out to California, he moved to the Bellevue Arms Apartments under the name Donald Evans. Now, when they go to this apartment, they find bloody footprints, which tells them that the crime could have been committed here. They also found partially burned drafts of ransom notes regarding Marion Parker and newspaper clippings found as well about the kidnapping. Now, when police asked the neighbors about Donald. They said they hadn't seen him in days, but that's not true. There was a half-eaten sandwich and a half-eaten, it was either a chestnut or a hazelnut found. And what is worse about this is the other half of that same nut was found in Marion's disemboweled stomach. Weird, right? But the police went to speak to the janitor at the building, and the janitor told them that they saw Donald carrying several packages to his car on the 16th, and he was seen wiping down his seats on the 17th. But where was he? So police would go back to Mary Holt and show her a picture of William Hickman, and she identified him as Mr. Cooper. 
But the question was, where was he? Apparently, he was last seen driving a green car in Albany, Oregon. The next day, apparently, they saw Hickman driving the same car in Washington. So the police end up pulling over this car in Portland. There was two other people in the car with Hickman. The cop then sees a gun in the car, and immediately they're told to get out of the car. They soon realize that this is Hickman, and the other two in the car were just simply hitchhikers. Hickman admitted that he disposed of his California license plate on the car and replaced them with plates he stole off of the car in Olympia just the day prior. He then would confess that he picked Marion up because he always saw her with her father. Before the kidnapping, he staked out the bank. He followed the movements of Perry Parker. The day of the abduction, he drove around with Marion, and he said that he even went to a movie with her in Alhambra called Figures Don't Lie. Now, eventually on the drive, he would stop to send telegrams and phone calls, and he had Marion write these telegrams. Hickman tried to say that a friend was involved, but this friend in particular was already in jail, um, so that was just no. And after he was extradited back to California, this is when he confessed to what he did to Marion. He said that he strangled her after he blindfolded her and tied her to a chair. Now, he strangled her with a towel to the point of her becoming incapacitated. He then undressed her and then would proceed to hang Marion upside down over the bathtub. This is when he slit her throat and hit her jugular, and this would eventually drain her body. Now, after disarticulating her arms and legs, he then disemboweled her, and it's during this time he then saw her body jerk, and her body kind of like almost flew out of the bathtub because she was still alive. Like, how she was still alive? I don't know. I don't know. He then would wrap her limbs in newspapers before putting them in a suitcase. He would then leave the apartment after committing the crime to see a movie, but he just couldn't pay attention during the movie. He thought if he saw it, it would, like, take his mind off of it, but he just couldn't focus. He then left and returned back. He would then think, hey, wait, if he wants Perry to believe that his daughter is still alive during this payment of the ransom, then he needs to make her look like she's still alive. This is when he attempts to reconstruct and disguise her body to the appearance of her still being alive. He put makeup on her face. He sewed her eyes open with a wire. He even said that Marion was safe and that her death was so sudden and unexpected that he was sure she was never in any pain and that she only cried a little bit. And she realized, this was after she realized she would never go home to her father. His trial was super quick, super quick to the point. The trial began on January of 1928. He used a plea of not guilty by reason of insanity. He said that he killed Marion because he stated that God told him he needed to kill her in order to resume his college life to become a minister. He was observed by a psychologist who said that he was completely sane and he was sound of mind. So that was a whole bunch of like crock shit. On February 28th, of 1928, he was found guilty of murder and he was sentenced to death by hanging. On October 19th of 1928, he was hanged in the gallows in San Quentin prison in California. Now, apparently when they pulled the trap door, uh, he struck his head on the flooring and he then violently, like his body violently really twitched and his body was jerking around until he stilled. His autopsy then showed that his neck did not break when he was hung in his death sentence, uh, well, during his death sentence and that he did die via asphyxia. What are your thoughts on this case of Marion Parker? I would love to know. Put them in the comments down below. This one was like why I never heard about this. I have no idea, but that my friends is the death of Marion Parker. I hope you guys enjoyed and I'll see you guys on another one.